Well, good morning. It's great to be uh, back here uh, in Kenya. Uh, it's great to be back here at uh, Mamlaka. Uh, I tell you, I don't know if you know how blessed you are to have a pastor like Pastor Charles. Uh, not only is he a great pastor, uh, he's a great friend. And uh, I appreciate him on so many levels, uh, but more than any, I appreciate his friendship. And um, he has a, a, just a heart for missions. As I watched uh, the video, uh, I just leaned over to him and just say, you know, God bless you. You all are, you all are doing great work in the kingdom of God. And so, uh, so God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. It's great to be here. Um, I bring you greetings from uh, Trinity Church, the elders, as well as the congregation. I hope you receive those greetings. I also bring you greetings from my family, Tanya, uh, Marvin Jr., Micah, and Michaela, and uh, they uh, send their greetings to you. I hope you uh, receive their greetings. Uh, I consider myself a part of the African uh, diaspora and uh, scattered uh, in the United States. Uh, I have no idea where my family originates um, in Africa uh, because I don't know that. Uh, I will choose Kenya as my home now, and uh, uh, so I'm glad to be home, glad to be home. Uh, it's great to be uh, here with you. I pray that God um, uh, speaks to you today uh, through, through his word. So, so we, we're family. I consider us family. So I'm going to tell you something that I've not told very many people. And, uh, and yet, it is a part of my reality. So until I was about 13 years old, I wet the bed. Yeah, I did. And I don't, I don't admit that. I don't, I don't tell a lot of people that. But it's a part of my reality. I can't tell you the prison in which I lived the prison of shame, the prison of humiliation, the prison of disgrace and self-degradation. I can't tell you the, 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 the self-rupturing of my soul. Many nights I would wake up early in the morning, two, three o'clock in the morning, and my clothes soaked with urine. My bed sheets soaked with urine. And like a ninja or a U.S. Navy SEAL, I would uh, stealthily scurry out of my room and try to hide my clothes from my parents. Because you shouldn't be 13 years old and still wetting the bed. So I, many, many mornings I would awake soaked in urine, and, and I, I found myself uh, hiding behind soap and water and a lot of lotion. Had I gone to school and the kids in my class found out that I wet the bed, that would be the end of me. I mean, I played baseball, I was very good at it, but I had a dirty little secret, I wet the bed. I was, a, I was a spelling bee king, if you will. I, I knew how, I, I was academically uh, on par with the best, but I carried the weight and the cargo of wetting the bed. If anybody in my class ever found out, that would be the end of me. My parents, it wasn't their intention, but when they asked me questions, did you wet the bed, with their furtive glances and their interrogation, even though they didn't mean to hurt me, I felt they were judging me. I was introduced very early to the emotion of shame. I'd imagine somebody listening to me right now, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You may, not have, you may not be able to define shame, but you know what shame is. Even though wetting the bed is not sinful, I only gave you that story to highlight the emotion of shame that I went through, the prison of shame that I lived in, the prison of self-disgrace and humiliation I lived in. And I would dare say, someone listening to me right now, you are living in your own prison of shame. 
You sang the songs and you're here and you're listening to the message. And yet week after week, you live in this, this, this prison, this incarceration of, of shame and self-degradation and disgrace. And you try to keep people at bay because if anybody got close to you, they just might find out your dirty little secret. So I'd imagine someone listening to me right now You're wanting to get up from your seat right now because this message is way too close to home for you. But you're sitting too close to the front, then everybody will know that I'm talking about you, all right? So so you'll sit there, and, and I believe the Spirit of God wants to do a work in your life as well as mine. Shame is like an aggressive prosecutor in the court of law. And, and shame is interrogating you, and shame is reminding you, and shame is letting you know how, um, reminding you of those issues in your life. A failed marriage. Not able to provide for your family. An absentee parent emotionally. A criminal history. Sexual um, impurity, sex before marriage, or adulterous relationship that you may have had or maybe you're presently in. Shame reminds us of all the stuff in our past, and it keeps us from living joyful Christian lives before our Father. I'm probably talking to someone right now. You come week after week. I lived it. I lived it. I've been there. And and you try to muster up the the ability to sing and have joy, but there's something that, that keeps it pressed down. And I would dare say for some, that might be shame. So the question that I'm asking myself, what is, what is shame? Here's a, here's a definition that John Bradshaw, psychologist, gives. He says, uh, shame is a state of being, a core identity. That is so, for some, shame is your identity. It's become who you are. Shame gives you a sense of worthlessness, a sense of failing and falling short of a human being, as a human being. Shame is a rupture of the self with the self. It is like internal bleeding. What picturesque words? An inner torment, a sickness of the soul. A shame-based person is haunted by a sense of absence and emptiness. So the question that I have for you who are present here and those who are listening on, who are live streaming this service, from where does shame come? I think that's a good question. That's a good beginning for you and I. uh, If if we experience this emotion, this very, very strong emotion that keeps us from the the best of God and the best from God, let's start from where does shame come? The interesting thing is, is that shame was never a part of God's original design. It was never a part of, of, of who we were, uh, who we were created to be. Listen to this. This is Genesis chapter 2, verse 25. And the man and his wife were both naked. And check this out. And were not ashamed. So check this, this is so cool. When, when we were first created in the garden. God created us to enjoy nakedness without being ashamed. Can you imagine? Can you imagine that clothing is actually to cover our shame? If it wasn't for Adam and Eve sitting in the garden, we would all be sitting up here naked. (laughs) Let's not imagine that too long, all right? (laughs) Can, Can you imagine the amount of money that we've spent on clothing? Thanks a lot, Adam and Eve. <laughs> I could have sent my I, I could I could send all of my kids to college for the amount of money we've spent on clothing. So from where does shame come? It was never a part of God's original plan. So if you're experiencing shame right now, 
in any capacity in your life, it's not from God. Somebody needs to hear that. The enemy says you ought to be ashamed of yourself. That's not from God. So the question is, so, so from where does it come? Well, after Adam and Eve obey, disobeyed God in the garden, they experienced an emotion that they had never experienced before, shame. Listen to this. So after they eat of the tree, this is what Genesis chapter 3, verses 7 through 11 says, and the eyes of them were both open, and they knew they were naked, naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings, and they heard the sound of the Lord of the God, uh, the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, where are you? He said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. I was afraid because I was ashamed. I was afraid because I knew that was something was amiss in me. I had experienced an emotion that I had never experienced before. And God said, who told you you were naked? This is an emotion that they had never experienced before. And with, the, with their failing God... Three relationships were ruptured. Adam's relation, Adam and Eve's relationship with God, Adam and Eve's relationship with themselves personally, and Adam and Eve's relationship with one another. So they hid from God. They sowed fig leaves to hide from them, uh, uh, to, to hide from themselves personally, and they sowed fig leaves together to hide from each other. Adam and Eve actually began to look at each other, and, and Adam said, oh, girl, you naked. And, and she said, ooh, you naked too, and you don't look all that good. So I'm, so I'm, I'm organizing that. That's, I'm making that up, all right? But that's kind of the idea. They felt shame. So let me give you a big thought. Give you a big thought. Shame is a result of sin. So wherever there is sin, you will find or should find shame. Where you and I ought to feel very uncomfortable is when we sin and there is no shame. If you and I sin and there is no, no, no sense of shame that I've broken the heart of a holy God, then something is amiss in our hearts. So sin, shame is a result of sin. Sin does not come from God. So here are some shame-based responses or reactions that we see in Genesis chapter 3. The first shame-based response is humiliation of self-exposure. And here's the, here's the text, Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, and they knew they were naked. They knew they were naked. So Adam and Eve, now, the moment they sinned, they actually began to know in themselves that they began to feel shame, not, not with each other, but Adam felt shame in himself. Let me see if, if, if John Bradshaw uh, can, can explain this. He says, exposure of oneself lies at the very heart of shame or the heart of shame. A shame-based person will guard against exposing his inner self to others. But more significantly, he or she will guard against exposing himself to himself. And the best way I can try to explain this is this. Is that you and I have this, this, this ability to compartmentalize our lives. So I have my Sunday life over here, and then my, my Sunday life is praise Jesus, read the Bible, sing songs, give my gifts, go to whatever Sunday school class or a class or a real group I'm a part of, and then I have my, my Monday through Saturday life over here. Like I'm partying, I'm doing whatever I'm doing, I'm, it's, it's a life over here, and I, I try not to mix the two lives up. 
Because if I ever mix the two lives up, somebody's going to find out that I'm living a double life here. And, 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 and because people have to see that, pray, praise Jesus, hallelujah, you know, they got to know that I am all good over here. But you know what ends up happening? It never fails. That somebody who lives over here finds out about you over here because they're at the same party you're at. <laughs> and then y'all make a pact. Can you please not tell anybody, you know? I lived that life for a long time. I got saved at 13 years old. And in high school, I was a party animal after giving my life to Jesus. And I learned how to be a hypocrite very, very quickly. And I had my church life over here, and I had my Friday party life over here. And then I would get up on Saturday morning and we would go out into the, uh, in, the, in the community witnessing, telling people about Jesus. One weekend, I was out witnessing and, and we came to a house and we witnessed to people that were at the party on the, the night before. And at that moment... At that moment, I recognized how big a hypocrite I was. I had it. God had exposed me to me. And I felt shame. And I rededicated my life to Jesus at that moment and, and watched God do some amazing things in my life. And so it was a shame-based reaction, this, self, this humiliation of self-exposure. Here's another shame-based reaction covering. And they sewed fig leaves, this is verse, uh, verse 7, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin cloths. I don't know if it was designer, I don't know if it was Louis Vuitton, I don't know if it was Vera Wayne, I don't know what kind of, I don't know what kind of fig leaves they were, but they did a lot of sewing together to cover themselves up. And you and I do a lot of sewing, you and I do a lot of covering, you and I do a lot of educating ourselves to try to cover ourselves from people so they won't find out about our shame. So covering is another shame-based reaction. Another shame-based reaction is hiding. Look at the text. It says, verse, this is verse 8, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. And so they hid themselves. And you and I, we hide ourselves so well in our, in our uh, careers, in our education, uh, in our background, in our family, in our money, in our schooling. We hide ourselves very, very well. And so the question that I have for you, what trees are you hiding among today? I spent a whole lot of years hiding. Whole lot of years hiding. Another shame-based reaction is paranoia or fear. Look at, listen to the text, verse 10. And he said, I heard the sound of you. Uh, this is Adam talking about talking to God. Heard, uh, heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. So paranoia. Paranoia, fear. Have you ever noticed, have you ever noticed, and again, I don't know if you've ever done this, but I know I have. Um, if I'm hiding something and it's, it's, it's sin and resulting in shame, if, 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 if it's sin resulting in shame and I'm, I'm hiding it and I'm covering it and someone can innocently come up to me and say, Hey, what's up, Marvin? How you doing? And I'm thinking in my mind, I, I bet they know. How do they know? How did they know? How did they know I did that? How did they know I did that? That's paranoia, you all. <laughs> That's fear of being found out. So you and I, you and I, we try to hide our history very quickly. So if, you are ever, if you've ever had any kind of shame-based response on the internet, internet pornography or whatever, the one thing that you have to try to do, you have to try to erase your history as quickly as you possibly can. But everybody knows you can't hide anything on the internet. It ultimately will be found out. And somebody just said, Dang, I didn't know you couldn't hide anything on the internet. I thought I got rid of it all. Paranoia. Here's another shame-based response. Deflection and blame. Verse 12, and the man said to the woman whom you gave me, the woman whom you gave me, 
to be with me is her fault, God. She gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. I wish I had time to talk about this text. I really wish I had time to talk about passivity because underneath this text is a passive Adam. Adam was right there with Eve when God gave the command and Adam was right there with Eve when the serpent was talking to Adam. Adam was right there with Eve and he could have slapped the fruit out of her hand. He could have said, girl, you better not eat that fruit. God told you you shouldn't eat that fruit. He could have done a lot of things, but that's not, that's not what I'm talking about today. I'm talking about shame. I'm not talking about passivity. I really wish I want, I really wish I could because it is right there in the text. All right. So, so deflection and blame. And some of us, some of us, when we're caught, We say it's because of my mom and my dad or the absence of my father, the absence of my mother. It was where I was raised. It was because of the poverty. It was because of who who my family was. It's because of the tribe I'm a part of. We deflect and we blame so that nobody gets close to us. So there are other responses to shallow relationships, self-condemnation, guilt and unworthiness, reminders of past of the past of the sin, uh, being robbed of forgiveness, the joy of forgiveness, uh, the reinforcement of our sins in the past. There are all kinds of reactions. But I want to talk just for the next few minutes. What do we do with our shame? Because I hear someone crying out, Marvin, yes, I'm shame. You got me. My hands are raised in the air. I feel shame. But what do I do with my shame? The first thing that you and I should do with our shame, we should cover our shame. Our shame should be covered. Our shame should be covered. I want you to notice something. Here's the first evidence of the gospel in the Old Testament. The, the first evidence of the gospel, even in Genesis. Look at what it says in ver, uh, chapter 3, verse 21. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. So here is a, pre, a pre-shadowing of Jesus dying on the cross. So God, even back then, recognized that there is no amount of human ingenuity, there is no amount of human covering that can cover our shame. Only God, the great God of the universe, can cover the shame of humanity. And so he gave us a foreshadowing of what Jesus would do. God killed animals and the blood from the animals or the blood, uh, the blood from the animals. He took the skin from the animals and he covered Adam and Eve and foreshadowing in the New Testament, the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, that the people's sins were forgiven based on the killing of animals and that blood being, uh, the animals being, uh, animals being killed and that blood covering them. And so even early on, God gives us a hint and a clue that shame can only be covered by God himself. So my friends, my brothers, my sisters, stop trying to cover your shame. Stop trying to hide. Stop trying to, stop trying to cover it up. Stop trying to hide in the trees. Only you can try to cover yourself. You can try to forgive your, in fact, you cannot forgive yourself. Only God can forgive. And the moment you and I try to forgive ourselves, we become God and we become our own idols. So stop trying to forgive yourself. You can't. You can only receive and accept what God has already done in Christ. So our shame must be covered. And in order for it to be covered, we actually have to expose it for Jesus to cover it. But I want to, I wanna, here's, here's, here's another part of our shame must be covered. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, this is Hebrews chapter 12, verses one and two. Let us also lay aside every weight and every sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter or the hero of our faith, who for the joy was set before him, here it is, endured the cross, despising the shame. And the word despising here means, it means um, disregarding the shame. And what that means is this, that when Jesus died on the cross, when he died on the cross, he told shame, 
you have no value in people's lives anymore. He died a shameful death so we can die a shameless, so we could live a shameless life. He went through crucifixion, the most horrendous and shameful way to die so that he could cover our shame. So here's another verse. Here's another verse. And this is what it says. This is, this is um, Revelation chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. Uh, For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. This is Jesus talking to the church at Laodicea. And then he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich. And then white garments, buy from me white garments so that you may be clothed or covered, uh, uh, so you may be clothed and covered, and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen. Can I borrow you right fast, Elvis? Can I borrow you very quickly? quickly, very quickly. I want to try to illustrate this. So here it is. What Jesus did does on the cross, what he does, he transfers by faith his righteousness to you and me. Yes, we've sinned in the past. Yes, we are, uh, we have shame. But when Jesus dies, and when you and I trust him by faith, he does this. He says, I am, now, now, now Elvis is in shame. He is like in a puddle of shame right now. You know, he's in a, he look, look at him. Just look at him. He is shame, just shameful, just shameful. So, so turn around, you got to turn around. You're not supposed to be laughing, man. You're supposed to be like, man, I'm shamed. Like, okay. You so, so, so what God does when Elvis says, by faith, Jesus, I give you my shame. What Jesus does, he says, Elvis, Lovi, I cover you with my righteousness. I cover you with my righteousness. So check it, check it. And now when God looks at Elvis, he no longer sees the shame. He no longer sees the sin. But you know what he sees? He sees now the righteousness of Jesus. He sees now Elvis as Elvis as if Elvis has never sinned. He is justified before God. He is made right before God, not because of Elvis, not because he is so smart, not because he is so handsome and he is handsome, not because he is a rugby coach, not because of that, because Jesus has covered him. Somebody needs to receive the covering of Jesus. You've been trying to do it yourself. You've been trying to cover yourself. And there's only one who can cover. And that's Jesus. His righteousness, standing now in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Not Elvis's righteousness, but Jesus's. Thank you, bro. Thank you. All right, two more. First, the sec- that's the first one. Our shame must be covered. Second. Our shame must be replaced. No, actually, our shame must be surrendered. So when you and I, even though our shame is covered, you and I still have bouts with shame. So you and I must, must, must daily surrender our shame to God. For those of you who are listening here and those who are live streaming, it, your shame must be surrendered to God on a daily basis. Check this out. This is, this is a psalm after David committed sin with Bathsheba. And David, listen to, listen to the psalm. This is Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord does not count, or uh, does the Lord counts no iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no deceit. For when I kept silent, and David kept silent about his sin and shame for an entire year, he said nothing to God about it. He was, car- par- he was compartmentalizing his life. 
He knew he had committed. He knew he had committed adultery. He knew he had committed murder. He knew that um, that the you know again the baby that had uh, that that was born died, and that was a part of the, the the consequences of his sin. But for a whole year, he said nothing to God. He didn't say, "God, forgive me." God, I'm sorry. He didn't say any of that. He didn't repent. He didn't turn. He just went on playing the harp. He went on king, being king of the kingdom. He went on with his life as usual. Until Nathan said to him, he was the man. And this is what David says. Verse four, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as the heat of summer. And then here is the surrender. I acknowledge my sin to you. God, I committed adultery. God, I committed murder. God, I committed treason against you. God, I did it. And you and I, you and I are in in the same place, right? You and I ought to acknowledge, not justify, not rationalize. God, I did that thing, whatever it is. Whatever the Spirit of God is convicting you of, whatever he's convicting me of, I ought to acknowledge it to God right now and say, God, yes, I did it. Not blaming, not deflecting, but God, it was me. And so he says, I acknowledge my sin to you and I did not cover my iniquity. I just laid, I just took it off. Like, like here it is, God. Here's my nakedness. Here's everything. I'm, I'm throwing it up there. There it is. That's what David did. And then this is what he says. I will confess. And the word confess is, I'm going to say the same thing, God, you say about my sin. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. And so, so somebody here today, you have to, you have to, you're in a place where you need to surrender your shame. Surrender it. Let it go. Stop holding on to it. If you're a man, if you're a woman, just, I'm, I'm God, I'm, I'm, I'm done with it. Today is another, God, I'm, I'm done. Here it is. So we must surrender. Here's the last. Our shame must be replaced. Our shame must be replaced. So let me give you a story in the Bible that hopefully this will make sense. So there's a story in 2 Samuel chapter 12. It's about the story, uh, chapter 13, actually. It's about the story of David's kids, Amnon, Tamar, and Absalom, but particularly Tamar and Amnon. So David has these kids, and so Amnon is, is Tamar's brother. And Amnon falls in love, he falls in love with his sister and wants to have sex with her. And y'all thought the Bible wasn't interesting. And Tamar says this, when Amnon says to her, lie with me, this is what Tamar says to Amnon. As for me, if you do this to me, where could I carry my shame? And I bet somebody's asking that question now. Where can I carry my shame? Where can I carry my shame? I've been holding on to it for a long time. Where can I carry it? I come to Mamlaka week after week. Where can I carry my shame? And Amnon talks to a friend, and the friend says to Amnon, this is what you should do. Why don't you play sick and have Tamar to come in and give you some soup? And when she comes in, take advantage of her and rape her. And that's exactly what Amnon did. And this is what Tamar does after her own brother rapes her. And Tamar put ashes on her, for, on her head and tore her long robe that she wore and she laid her hand on her head and went away crying aloud as she went. So I want you to put together, where can I go with my shame? And I want you to, I want you to think about, now she's crying in her shame. She is literally just like, like, uh, like, leave, uh, like, um, uh, like Elvis was up here. She is literally in a puddle of shame. Where can she go? This is the beauty of the Bible. A few centuries later, when one of God's prophets was now predicting the coming of Messiah, and this is what he says in Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to, our God, to comfort all who mourn 
and to grant those who mourn in Zion. And here it is. Here it is. I want you to think. I want you to hear this. To give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes. Look at Tamar's ashes on her head. And God says to Tamar, I have someone. If you give me your ashes, I will give you my beauty. If you give me your mourning, I will give you oil of gladness. If you give me your shame, I will give you something in return. Here's the great exchange. Give God the ashes of your shame. And what God says, I will give you beauty. There's a young lady listening to me right now. You feel dirty and ugly and unworthy and unvaluable. And God says, you, are with, you have ashes on your forehead metaphorically and maybe even literally. And you're saying, nobody will touch me. Nobody will want me. And God says, give me your ashes. And I'll give you my beauty. And I'll make you so beautiful that every other man will be like, who is that? And that's, beauty of, that's the beauty of God. So replace your shame. The great exchange. So somebody's listening to me right now. I'm done. Somebody's listening to me right now. And you are living in shame. And I want you to know If you don't hear anything else, if you are in Jesus, you are the righteousness of God. If you are in Jesus, you are God's treasured child. And so I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask very quickly, very quickly. I'm just going to do this very quickly. I'm going to do this very quickly. If you're here, if if you can bow your heads and close your eyes, if if you don't mind. If you're here, you say, Marvin, I've been living in shame. I'm here today, but man, this was like... Like, how did, like, did, like, did the U.S., like, bug my room and give you the answers? Like, did they, they tell you about my life? That's the, that's the Spirit of God. And so I'm going to ask, if I was talking to you, if the Word of God was talking to you, if you've been living in a prison of shame and want to be set free from that prison, I'm going to ask you to do something. I'm going to ask you to do something very brave, something very courageous. I'm going to simply ask you to stand right where you are. It's, it's not about somebody else. It's not about whatever somebody else is. I'm just asking you just to stand right where you are. You know, you know where you've been. You know what, what you, you know the shame that you've been experiencing. I see you. Thank you. And you said, I want to exchange my shame now for God's beauty. I see you. I see you. Thank you. I want to exchange my shame for God's beauty. I see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. If you're a man, if you're a woman, if you're a family, if you're a couple, and, and, and it's just you've been living in this area. And I know our, our, our time is, is I, I want to pray with you. I want to ask God's blessing over you. I want to ask God's freedom in your life. And even while I'm praying, if you just want to stand, even as, as I'm praying, just, just say, say, Marvin, I, I, I am tired. I want to live in the righteousness of Jesus. I am tired of the self-condemnation. I am tired of the self-disgrace. I, I don't want to live that way any longer. I am the righteousness of God. I am worthy, not because of me, but because of what Jesus has done. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I get so loud. I get loud because I I, I believe in this moment. I believe in this moment. This moment, I believe the Spirit of God wants to set somebody free. And Satan is trying to tell you that that you're you're, you're going to do the same thing tomorrow. You're going to do the same thing tomorrow. And I'm going to visit you again tomorrow. And I'm going to be in your room tomorrow. And I'm going to tell, and you're going to go back to the same thing you were doing. And you tell Satan right now, you are a liar. I am the righteousness of God. I am a treasured child of God. I am worthy because of what Jesus has done. So, Father, thank you. Thank you for this moment, God. Thank you for your presence in this place. Thank you for the righteousness of your son, Jesus. We stand in his righteousness alone. And we stand before you now with great confidence, not because of who we are, but because of what he's done. 
So Father, I pray your blessing over my brothers and sisters right now. God, I pray you would set them free from the prison of their shame. God, I pr pray you would set them free from what they, what they used to be. God, I pray you would set them free now, God, and let them experience the joy of their salvation. And may they come with you with confidence, confidence standing before you in Jesus. And may they give their lives and their there. May, they, may they give their hands and maybe, maybe, may you establish the work of their hands and order their steps so that they may be fully vested in your kingdom. Not one foot in and one foot out, God. I pray for a breakthrough right now, God. I pray that you would quell and stop the lies of the enemy in their mind. Cause them to be free. We bless you, God. We honor you in this place today as our liberator, as the one who sets us free, as the one who gives us a new lease on life. We pray all of this in Jesus' matchless name. Amen. Psalm 51, dear Psalm is acknowledging his sin before God. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sins. For my transgressions, for I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. But then he goes on to say, cleanse me with hyssop. Only God can set us free. We are reminded today by our brother, Pastor Marvin, only in Christ, in Christ alone, can we be made whole. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear the joy and the gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart oh God he can do that he can do that create in me a clean heart and renew a steadfast spirit within me do not cast me away from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me let's do two verses of in Christ alone as we are reminded that only in him can we do this in Christ alone? In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, found through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love! 
Open my lips, O Lord, and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifices, O Lord, bring them. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. You, O God, will not despise. And so hear the cry of your children today. Take away the shame and the self-condemnation and the guilt. Replace it with a crown of beauty. Replace it, O oh God, with the, with the oil of joy. O oh God, only you can make us sinful, fallen, helpless humanity. Only you can remake us into oaks of righteousness. A planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. And because of this, we honor you, we thank you, we celebrate you. Let's celebrate the Lord today and receive his healing in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Have a wonderful week.